Good afternoon, everybody. This is Andrew Bram from the University of Arkansas. Welcome to today's PaveNR session. Today we'll be talking about new developments in airfield pavements. Some logistics of PaveNRs before we start. If you do have a question during the presentation, I encourage you to raise your electronic hand, which you can find on the left side of your screen just above the list of participants. And when you uh, raise your hand, I'll be able to see that you have a question. And then I will either answer the question at that time or pause at a convenient break. And you can type your question into the chat box, which is in the lower left-hand portion of the screen. And when you hit Enter, um, I will be able to see the question that you're asking. After the presentation is over, professional development hours will be emailed to you at the email address you provided while logging in. So for the, the last webinar of the, the fall semester, we'll be talking a little bit about some new developments in airfield pavements. And while I was putting this presentation together, I, I quickly realized that it would be beneficial to have a little bit of background about um, how airfield pavements are designed. And that goes with AC, it's number 150-5320-6E. And also to think about the airplane considerations. So when you're comparing um, highway engineering, highway design, or roadway design with uh, traditional person vehicles compared to airplanes, there's obviously quite a large differentiation between those. And then also talk a little bit about what's called the cumulative damage factor. And that is what the basis of airport pavements are designed on. Then briefly, I'll go over a little bit of the soil considerations, the flexible pavement, and the rigid pavement design strategies. And we'll finish up looking at um, the new techniques in pavement rehabilitation, and then also an example of some sustainability at airports. So just to give some examples of what people are doing today in order to help efficiently design airport uh, pavement structures. So a little bit of background on airfield pavement design. The official advisory circular, or AC, of the Federal Aviation, you can see the number right there, the 150-53206E. That was released September 30th of 2009, and it goes over the airport payment design and evaluation. And the URL you see on the slide, you're not able to click on that through the software, but I will cut and paste that URL into the chat box. So if you would like to, you can click on that, and you'll be able to uh, download the, the document that I'll be covering here. An important um, point in this document is that it does not dictate landing gear design. So landing gears are, are the configurations of tires and weights that are applied onto the pavement structure. And the FAA does not dictate what sort of landing gear can be used. It simply um, allows and incorporates new types of landing gears into their design strategies. And when you look at kind of the development of this, the airfield pavement design by the FAA, it really started in the late 1950s, 1958. And they limited a maximum load configuration of a 350,000 pound airplane with a DC-8 landing gear configuration. So uh, DC-8s are actually extremely rare to be in the air at all, uh, much less a passenger flight. They're really only uh, a couple of cargo planes and then vintage planes. But this is really what the entire design strategy is based around, is this weight limit and this landing gear configuration. And everything kind of um, goes from there. But the, the point of that is that these newer airplanes that have been developed in the past 60 years cannot stress the pavements more than this original configuration. So there, although the FAA doesn't dictate landing gear design, it does kind of force uh, airplane manufacturers to account for this uh, design consideration for the pavement structure in designed landing gears. The circular covers two types of pavement design, a flexible pavement design and a rigid pavement design. For the flexible pavement design, they follow a layered elastic theory. 
And then for the rigid pavement design, they follow a finite element theory. And as I mentioned before, these design strategies can incorporate new landing gear, but at the end of the day, the um, manufacturers are restricted to the, that type of landing gear, uh, maximum weights. And the circular describes that they must provide adequate smooth support for the loads imposed by airplanes to produce a firm, stable, smooth, all-year, all-weather surface free of debris. And that sounds suspiciously like what we need to do when we're designing traditional highway or city pavements, except for the very, very last part of that quote, which is uh, all-weather surface free of debris. And the, the debris is important because the debris can get caught up in engines, and it can damage engines and damage airplanes behind it. So the, the concept of being free of debris is critical in the pavement design. You don't want the pavement raveling or have any sort of deterioration that would cause it to come up into the aircraft engines. And if you're going to uh, do a design selection based on the least cost, the circular requires you to do a life cycle cost analysis. And we'll go over an example of a life cycle cost analysis at the end of the presentation. An acronym you'll see quite a bit if you're looking at airfield pavement design is FARField, which stands for the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, Rigid and Flexible Iterative Elastic Layer Design. So that's the acronym for FARField. And they split it into two different weight classes, either greater than or less than 30,000 pound aircraft. And we're going to focus on the greater than 30,000 pound aircraft in this presentation. In addition to the uh, rigid and flexible pavements that can be either a new build or you can also do overlay designs. An example we'll go over later in this presentation is about uh, the history of uh, St. Louis's, one of their main runways, and how there's been quite a few overlays placed on top of existing pavements. So overlay design is an integral part of the FAA design guide. They want to design for a minimum of a 20 year structural life. And like I mentioned in the uh, introductory slide, they use a cumulative damage factor, or a CDF. And this is simply a ratio of the number of applied load repetitions to the number of allowable load repetitions to failure. So when you're designing these pavements, you have uh, load repetitions, kind of similar in concept to easels, or equivalent single axle loads in highway design. And you simply take the actual number of load repetitions to the allowable load repetitions to failure, and that can give you your cumulative damage factor. And if that value is less than one, the pavement has remaining fatigue life. If it's greater than one, then the uh, pavement has run its course and its fatigue life has ended. When you're going through Fairfield and using Fairfield, which is a computer or far field, which is a computer uh, program, you can have six different types of airplanes, either a generic, which is uh, uh, aircraft configuration that you can dictate on your own. You can go with typical Airbus or Boeing products, which are the two largest airplane manufacturers. They have other commercial airlines from Bombardier, Candidair, those types. Uh, general aviation, which is the smaller airplanes that are often privately owned, and the military airplanes. And the pavement design is based off the gross weight of an airplane. So a lot of these internal library files have standard aircraft weights already included within them. An interesting part of aircraft pavement design, or airplane, airfield pavement design, is that you assume your maximum anticipated takeoff weight is the design weight. And that is because airplanes, when they're taking off, contain all of the fuel they need for the flight. And that fuel is very heavy. So uh, when it lands, when people often think of the maximum load being applied to the pavement, the airplane is significantly lighter than when it had taken off. So the maximum weight has actually occurred, and the maximal, maximum stresses on the pavement actually occurs during the takeoff of the airplane. And approximately 98% of the weight is carried by the main landing gears, which is underneath the wings of the plane in the back part, and then approximately 5% is carried by the nose gear, which is up in front of the plane. And because the maximum anticipated takeoff weight is the uh, design weight, 
the FAR field only considers departures and it does not consider any arrivals as movements across the pavement surface. And as I mentioned, that's because the um, you have less weight on arrival due to the fuel consumptions. And in addition, as a plane is landing, the lift on the wing forces actually reduces the applied load on the pavement. So when the plane actually touches down, there's still lift being applied on the wings, and those forces reduce the amount of force being transferred down into the pavement structure. When I went up to uh, Wisconsin for Thanksgiving over the past weekend, we had to fill up the tires with air because the tire pressures went below because we went from approximately 60 degrees here in Arkansas to 10 degrees in Wisconsin. And I noticed that the tire pressure minimum was 34 PSI. So it was pretty exciting when I I saw the expected tire pressure on an airplane tire is 221 PSI. So when you think about the weights that are being applied, not only are the configurations differently, there are a lot higher weights, and then you have this much higher tire pressure on airfield pavements versus uh, typical highway pavements. So all of these things really do cause uh, quite a significant change in design and design strategy. Now, as I mentioned, there were six groups of aircraft types all lumped together. These are just some examples from the Boeing family of aircraft. You have a, a typical dual landing gear configuration in the upper left-hand corner, which is a Boeing 737. It's uh, the same as an Airbus A320 or A321. You have a, a three-dual tandem, which is a Boeing 777, which is three wheels lined up there. And then the Boeing 747 is, is much more complex. It has a two dual tandem main gear and a two dual tandem body gear. But there's all these different types of tire configurations. And again, all of these tire configurations and imprint configurations were based off that DC-8 load limit that was originally designed for far field. And then these are all simply um, kind of growths from that original load limit. When you think about general principles of airfield pavement design for flexible pavements, we're looking for the um, to determine the maximum vertical strain at the top of the subgrade. So when you're thinking about uh, vertical strain on top of the subgrade, that's looking for any sort of vertical deformation, so what we would consider uh, a type of rutting action. And then you're also looking for the maximum horizontal strain at the bottom of an asphalt surface layer, and that asphalt surface layer um, the maximum horizontal strain, that could cause some uh, fatigue cracking in the pavement layers if that's exceeded. Far field provides required thicknesses of surface, base, and sub-base to support a given airplane traffic mix. So once you've imported your uh, airplane traffic mix and you've gone through the um, iterations, you'll be given the thickness of the surface, the base, and the sub-base. So that is the output of far field, is these thicknesses. Now for a, a rigid pavement, you also look at the maximum horizontal stresses at the bottom edge of a PCC slab. And this is important because um, the, the horizontal stresses, those indicate if there's any sort of potential failure or cracking that could occur on the bottom of these PCC slabs. And they determine this using the edge loading condition. So if you can imagine looking down on a, say, a, a 20 by 20 foot square PCC slab, they assume that that aircraft tire is seen at the edge of the pavement, and that is um, where the stresses will be formed and the analysis will be done. And that's uh, opposed to the stresses being on a corner or in the middle of the slab, which have different uh, types of stress conditions. But for far field, they went ahead and used the edge loading condition. And then um, the output for rigid pavements from far field is to provide the required thickness of the rigid pavement slab to support the given airplane traffic mix. So a little bit of uh, differences between flexible pavement and rigid pavement, but at the end of the day, you're looking to get thicknesses out of the design guide. An important term when we're thinking about developing this cumulative damage factor, or the ratio of the number of applied load repetitions to number of allowable load repetitions, is you need to know what the effect of tire widths are, because that will influence how quickly you reach your cumulative design factor. 
So this is just a, a simple schematic showing the uh, surface course, then your pavement structure, the top of the subgrade, and the subgrade. And just like highway pavements or city pavements, airfield pavements are meant to take uh, relatively narrow high loads and distribute those loads outward. So as they go through the pavement structure, when they hit the subgrade, you have a relatively lower but much wider stress that's being applied on the subgrade. So as you move down through your pavement structure, which here is indicated by the H on the left-hand side of the screen, it is a 1 to 2 ratio, and the, attire, the effective tire width is essentially the width of the tire and then half the thickness on each side of the pavement or of the, the tire footprint. And this is important then when looking at your cumulative damage factor, which you can see here on this slide. If you're looking from the distance from the center line, this appears to be uh, a 737. Well, there's three different examples. You have a, a 747, a 777, and a DC-8. And you can see how these different airplane configurations put different CDFs on the pavement, um, on the pavement layer. And what we're interested at the end of the day is looking at this airplane mix, which is the cumulative line, which shows the entire uh, distribution of the cumulative damage factor across the entire pavement width. So by using far field, you can not only uh, determine the thicknesses you need, but then you can also run these analysis to determine approximately where on your pavement surface you'll expect to reach your fatigue uh, failure limit first. And here, it looks like with this mix of aircraft, it's about, I would say, um, 270 inches laterally from the center line on each side. And that's where your CDF goes up to one. So that's just a kind of a background overview. When people think about pavement design, they often think about a highway or, or city or township pavement design. When you're thinking about airfield pavement design, there's, there's quite a bit of different mindsets that you want to get into. So before we go into the soils, the flexible pavement requirements, and the rigid pavement requirements, uh, I'll take any questions now. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon above the list of participants. And if you do raise your hand, then you can type your question into the chat box, and I'll be able to read it and, and answer it. Well, there don't seem to be any questions at this point, so we'll move on to the design of airfield pavements. So like many uh, pavement design strategies, the, um, the soil, what's in the subgrade and what you have in place is critical for the effective performance of the pavement. So when you're thinking about airfield pavement design, you want to make sure that you run the proper soil tests, you classify the system according to the Unified Soil Classification System, you run some soil strength tests, you may need to stabilize your subgrade, you have to account for seasonal frost and also permafrost. So when we're thinking about some soil tests that need to be run during the airfield pavement design, you look at your particle size analysis, which in the world of, of um, asphalt and concrete pavements is your gradation, your liquid limit, plastic limit, plasticity index, moisture density relations, and the standard and modified proctor. So just getting an understanding of how your, your soil is behaving with these results, you can then classify it according to the USCS. You're also very interested in finding out what the soil strength is, and there's various tests that can be used to determine that. The California bearing ratio, which is commonly called CBR, the plate bearing test, the direct shear test, and also the field vein test. So quite a few options there for determining your soil strength test. If you find out that your soil is not strong enough, in order to um, provide the loads that you need for your airfield, you can choose to stabilize that subgrade soil. And you can either do that chemically or mechanically. Examples of chemically are cement or lime stabilization, uh, perhaps asphalt stabilization as well. Mechanical stabilization could include mixing in um, like a type of aggregate or something of those sorts. For the seasonal frost design, you need to account for any sort of uh, frost susceptibility, which is key to the depth of frost penetration. So when you're thinking about 
the, your pavement layer seen on top of your subgrade during extreme cold events, you will start to get freezing in your subgrade. And that can cause extensive problems, especially if you have free water. If you have free water in your system, that can start expanding as it freezes, which is uh, not good for your pavement structure. Then as it thaws, it can actually start collapsing again, also not good for your pavement structure because you decrease your strength and you decrease the effectiveness of your pavement um, structure. And then permafrost design, if you're in an area that has permafrost, there's various things that need to be accounted for in that as well. As I mentioned before, there are two modes of failure for the flexible pavements. You have vertical strains in the subgrade, which often translates into rutting, and then you have horizontal strains in the asphalt layer, which can translate into cracking. For a far field, they have the 20-year minimum structural design life. They also specify a minimum of four inches of hot mix surfacing. Now, traditionally, you have some sort of mix of hot mix asphalt and then base courses, but full depth design is accepted on a case-by-case -case basis. You need to ensure that you have proper uh, drainage in your pavement layers and that there's no issues with that sub-base course um, in order to utilize the full depth asphalt technologies. During the design strategy, they fix the modulus to 200,000 PSI and the Poisson's ratio to 0 0.35. And that's convenient in some ways because you can um, it simplifies the design process pretty significantly, but it also kind of hinders the use of any sort of innovative materials that could perhaps increase your modulus values or affect your Poisson's ratio that could actually lead to better uh, performance. That's for the, uh, up till now, I've been talking about the flexible pavement itself. Underneath the flexible pavement, if you choose to stabilize a layer, if you have a flexible stabilization, like an asphalt emulsion stabilization or something similar, they set the modulus to 400,000 PSI and a 0.35 Poisson ratio. And then if you do something like cement stabilization, which is a type of rigid stabilization, that's a 700,000 PSI modulus and a 0.2. So again, it's interesting how they set these limits, which allow for less flexibility, but it also makes it a little more straightforward. And in addition to your asphalt layers and any sort of stabilized layers, you can also have a crushed aggregate base course. So these are um, some guidelines for your minimum aggregate base course thickness for flexible pavements. So when you're designing your flexible pavement, you have your surface courses, uh, which are your asphalt uh, concrete materials. Then you have your base courses and under that the subgrade. So there's a whole bunch of different gear types that are designed. And you can see there are some gear types that are associated with different types of aircraft. As you get down, you get to more examples. For example, a Boeing 757 or a 767, all the way down there to the new Airbus A380. But you can see what the design load range is for these different aircrafts. And there's an incredible, incredible range of design loads, all the way from 30,000 pounds to almost 1.3 million pounds. And then you can see with that, the um, minimum base course thickness also starts increasing. So for these lower pound ranges, the, the 30 to 50 and the 50 to 100, you have about four to six inches. And then as you get into the larger, ag larger aircraft, you can get a, a thicker base course up into the nine to 10 inch range. That was for flexible pavements, just to cover some rigid pavement design strategies. Um, similar to airfield or similar to highway pavements, there is differences in how you categorize what is beneath the surface layers. So what is beneath the hat mix asphalt or the asphalt concrete versus the Portland cement concrete. And for the rigid pavements of the Portland cement concrete, you need to calculate the modulus for the subgrade. So whatever the material is in place, what sort of modulus does that have? And you can either find that by, um, we well, need to find that by using these two equations. So the first is the resilient modulus of the subgrade, which is in PSI. And that's simply a function of the foundation modulus of the subgrade, which is in PCI. And then the foundation modulus, which is K, 
can be found by using that equation, which is a function of the CBR, or the California Bearing Ratio. And if you'll notice, or if you recall, there were four different soil strength tests, the California Bearing Ratio, the Plate Bearing Test, Direct Shear Test, and the Field Vein Test. There's other equations that can relate the foundation modulus to all four of those values. I simply showed the California Bearing Ratio here in this slide. Four rigid uh, pavement layers. The standard sub-base depth is four inches, and this can be uh, different types of variously crushed aggregate. It can be asphalt stabilized. It can be cement stabilized. So a lot of different types of sub-bases can be used. And the standard depth is four inches, but you can have some flexibility with how many layers you have. Anywhere from one to three layers can be used in your design strategy. If you recall, when we were talking about loads being applied on rigid pavements on these concrete slabs, the, uh, the loads are the highest stresses were recorded at the edge of the slab. And when you think about the gear load that needs to be either tangent or perpendicular to the slab edge. So if it's going along longitudinally with the slabs uh, going along the sides, or if it's going perpendicular as it's crossing the transverse slab joints, um, you need to do an analysis on both those configurations. When you get those stresses, you want to reduce that stress by 25% because you're assuming you have some load transfers through the joints, whether it's transverse or longitudinals, and you want to choose the larger of the two stresses. So by comparing the tangent stresses, which are the longitudinal direction, or the perpendicular stresses, which are across uh, the transverse joints, you want to choose the larger of those two stresses. When you're determining the strength of the concrete, one of the inputs, you take the flexural strength at 28 days, and Farfield recommends 600 to 700 PSI for most airfield applications. You want to have a minimum thickness of six inches, regardless of what type of aircraft are on there. Like the uh, flexible pavement or the asphalt concrete, they fix a modulus for the Portland cement concrete value, and that's set at 4 million PSI. And then there's several guidelines for embedded steel for the um, dowel bars, for the um, transverse bars, all these different types of steel configurations you can have. And I didn't want to go too much into those details, but I just wanted to, you to be made aware that there is a um, is considerations for that type of embedded steel. In any concrete pavement design, the type of joints are very important, and that also goes for airfield pavements. There are four type, or three types of, of joints that they consider in um, far field and the FAA design guide. The first is isolation joints. And an example of these isolation joints is where you can increase your thicknesses along the edge of the slab, and you do not have dowel bars. And what this does, by increasing these thicknesses along the edges, that's where they claim, the, or that's where they set the highest stresses at. So if you have a thicker pavement layer where the higher stressors are, you can optimize your design. For contraction joints, there are uh, effects of moisture and temperature to shrinkage and expansion of the concrete slabs. So you want to control that cracking that is caused by that. And also, contraction joints can decrease the stresses caused to slab warping. For construction joints, this is at the end of the day when you finish your paving operation. You want to make sure you have a nice uh, vertical cut in your pavement, and then um, that will provide your construction joint. And you may have some tie bars at the end of that as well, depending on your design strategy. As a rule of thumb, when you're thinking about joints in airfield pavements, your joint spacing should not exceed 24 times the slab thickness. And um, again, there's a lot more details about these joints, just like there were about the metal reinforcements within pavements in the circular. I just want everyone to get kind of a global understanding of, of what goes on in the aircraft design, in the pavement design. Here are some pictures of those joints. You can see with the isolation joint, you have uh, steadily increasing thicknesses as you go from the approximately the middle of the slab toward the end. 
and it says uh, not less than 10 feet or 3 meters is that taper. So it's a very steady taper as you go along the, the thickness. But these joints are where there's a lot of weaknesses, and it's where we assume the highest stresses start forming. That's why you have that uh, thicker layer. And then if you choose to have um, bars instead, you can have metal reinforcement, and that's going in and out of the paper here on the bottom, excuse me, in and out of the screen here on the bottom. And you can have reinforcement, and that will also increase the ability for these edges to, to absorb the stresses that are formed on those edge loads of the aircraft pavement. For contraction joints, this is very similar to a, a highway here. You can have dowel bars in there, and um, you put some sort of joint in, a crack forms beneath that joint, and then that metal can um, help either use it in a hinge, which is that type B, or a dowel configuration, which is the type T, on the upper right hand side of the screen. And similar to pavements, it's about halfway down through the pavement layer. And then finally, the construction joint. This is at the end of the day when you have that nice straight uh, vertical edge. You can also put um, a, a bar in there in order to tie together the two days of, of construction. So just some examples of, of joints and joint configurations that are used in, in aircraft pavements. So really up to here, the background and the design that's kind of covering the fundamentals of airport pavement design. And the next two sections, the rehabilitation and the sustainability, we'll be looking at two case studies to kind of show how different airports have, how one airport has looked at the rehabilitation of a runway, and then how a second airport has used a sustainable concept in order to um, um, address their, their design. So if there's any questions, please raise your electronic hand and uh, type the question in the chat box. It looks like we have a couple questions and people are typing in. So when those answers are, uh, or when the questions are typed in, um, I'll answer them as they come. So the um, Alex's question is the newest advisory circular eliminated expansion joints. Do you see an advantage to this? <laughs> Uh, to be honest, Alex, I, I don't know. So expansion joints are just a, another type of joint that have um, that have existed. I think that in general, expansion joints are kind of being phased out in pavement design in general. I'm reaching back to a training I did at the Portland Cement Association a couple years ago that talked about how expansion joints are are just not as commonly used anymore. So. Often the FAA takes um, design clues from um, from highway or, or street pavement design. So I'd assume as the expansion joints are being phased out of the highway design, they're also starting to then be phased out of the airfield design. But that that's just kind of an extrapolation of, of something I'd heard before. So so I hope that helps. And the second question from Mark is um, what are the benefits, the pros and cons to a dowel joint versus a keyed joint? So let's um, let's bring that dowel joint up here again. So the dowel joint is up in the upper uh, right hand corner, and a dowel joint. My understanding is uh, dowel joints are where you have a actual piece of metal in the pavement, and that metal prevents any sort of horizontal excuse me, it prevents any sort of vertical movement. So as an aircraft tire goes from one slab to another, there's no sort of vertical movement. A dowel, however, does allow for expansion and contraction in the horizontal direction due to temperature and moisture changes, which is a large benefit. Now, when I think of a key joint, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but when I think of a key joint, I think of more of a... Um, where the, the concrete is actually placed so it abuts into the, the joint next to it. So it's actually kind of construction technique. And I'll, I'll see if I can um, draw it on here. But when I think of a key joint, 
you have one slab that has a shape like that, and then the slab next to it has a shape like that. So when I think of key joints, that's what I think of. And you can see from that configuration, I apologize for my, my drawing. It's certainly not my strong point right here. But the the benefit of this is it restricts any sort of vertical movement, which is good. So you want to restrict vertical movement. And it allows for horizontal movement, which is good, uh, because they can expand and contract. I think the disadvantage of these key joints, however, is that it's a lot more complicated to actually construct this in the field. So having to actually go out there and, and provide either some sort of um, special form work or have some sort of special uh, um, like uh, configuration, like forms on the side, or like if you're using a slip paver, you could like cut the edge or something. I think that this is just a lot more complicated to have um, as you produce in the field. Now, this is cheaper because you don't have any metal, but I think this geometry is just a little more tricky to um, to implement in the field. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you for those questions. And as I mentioned, if you have questions, you can you can raise the hand as we go through, or you can wait to a little break in the slides. So for the rehabilitation of pavements, we're going to look at an example in St. Louis at Lambert Field. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to think about investigating, analyzing, and trying to make a decision-making process in developing long-term rehabilitation strategies. This is a relatively mature airport, so their infrastructure that's in place is adequate for the, the movement needs but how can they take care of their payment structure in order for it to um, last in the future in an economic way? They took a look at their primary runway, which is the 12R30L runway. And it's 11,000 feet long, 200 feet wide. And it has a Portland cement concrete surface. It was constructed in 1981 to 1982. That's when the current surface was constructed. We'll go a little more into their construction history. And it's currently sitting with in what they consider a fair condition, and that has a PCI rating of 68, pavement condition index of 68. Their primary distresses is longitudinal cracking, and there is some map cracking and pack, patching. And the, um, the biggest concern here from an airplane consideration is the FOD, or the foreign object debris. And this potential is increased when you have this map cracking, which can create small pieces that come up. And as those uh, small pieces come up out of the pavement, they can get kicked up or sucked into an aircraft engine, which can um, cause significant damage to aircraft engines. And this is from an article from the 2013 Airfield and Highway Pavement Conference in Los Angeles. It's by Sander and Beckman. And it was put out by the American Society of Civil Engineers. This is an overview of Lambert Airport. Um, you can see the terminals are just to the right of the, the circle. The circle here is over runway 12R30L. And then they have uh, three other runways. One is parallel. Two of them are parallel to this main runway that we'll be looking at. And then one is at an angle. So they have a four runway configuration. The one that they're interested in here is in the middle of the airport nearest to the terminals. And the reason it's, near, reason it's nearest to the uh, terminals is it was actually built in 1946. And what, when it was originally built, they built 13 inches of Portland cement concrete. Over the years, it was lengthened. And in the early 60s and 70s, they had a series of asphalt overlays. So uh, in 1946, that original thickness was adequate for lengthening. But then in the 60s and 70s, as aircrafts got heavier and tire pressures increased, the, the structure of the pavement was not enough, so they started putting asphalt overlays on top. One of the benefits of airport pavements is that you, uh, well, you do not have any sort of vertical clearance issues, so you can just put as many overlays as you want, and you don't need to worry about bridges or, um, or any sort of like drainage uh, off to the sides. All that can be accommodated relatively easy. So in the 60s and 70s, they had uh, a series of asphalt overlays constructed. 
And this not only increased the load carrying capacity, but it also uh, increased or improved the surface condition. Then in the early 1980s, they placed a 15-inch Portland cement concrete overlay, and they extended the runway 1,250 feet, and that was 1,000 feet on one end and 250 feet on the other end. And because that was a new pavement, they simply put 16 inches of PCC and then six inches of asphalt base in that pavement structure. So the main core of the runway had the PCC with the asphalt overlays and then the 15 inches of PCC, whereas the edges just had 16 inches of PCC and six inches of asphalt base. And the uh, large portion of the existing pavement is reaching 30 years old. And if you remember, the far field did a design for a minimum of 20 years. So as you get to 30 years, that pavement's getting older, and they're looking to do some work for it. Now, another big problem that St. Louis has experienced is a lot of the growth of the airport was due to it being a, a significant hub, one of the primary hubs for TWA and then American. When American took over TWA, it kind of downsized the hub status, so it went from a large hub to a medium hub, which not only decreased revenues, but it increased their debt service. So they have a lot of infrastructure that they need to maintain and rehabilitate, but they're actually getting less money because there's less air, airline traffic. So this is a, a pretty significant problem in St. Louis. These are some examples of um, their PCI surveys and some pictures. Now, obviously, being the primary runway, a lot of their work had to be done at night, so that's why the picture quality is, is not as good as it could be because it had to be done when the the, um, the runway was shut down, which is at night in this case. And they've had four PCI surveys over the past 15 years. So they had one in 1995, 2001, 2007, and uh, 2010. And you can see, um, in general, there's kind of a downward trend. It bounces around a little bit, but it's gone from 82 down to 68. And they assumed that the map and shrinkage cracking was from alkali silica reaction, or ASR. So as they were kind of troubleshooting why these deteriorations were occurring, that is uh, what they determined, is it was from ASR. And there'll be a little more on that in an upcoming slide. So it, it looks like there's a, a question, so I'll take a, a quick break as that question is being typed in, and um, I will we'll answer that as it comes. So the question from Carol is, does the FAA expect 100% of the pavements to meet the 20-year service life, or are small amounts of premature failure acceptable by the FAA? Well, that's an interesting question. I think, um, first of all, the FAA does not, um, does not accept any, uh, any failures of the pavement. When we're thinking about the difference between the, the design life and the actual performance, the design life is just what we expect to happen. So when we're designing a pavement, we have to uh, anticipate what sort of weather conditions will occur. We have to anticipate what sort of loads will be applied. And so in order to do that, we can try and then anticipate how long the pavement will last. So we kind of take all the aircrafts we expect, what kind of growth we expect, what kind of loads and tire pressures we accept, and then we expect over a 20-year period, and then we can design a pavement based on that 20-year period. Now, the, the theory, though, is that we're trying to design a pavement to go either 20 years or further. Now, if there's unexpected loads, if they're higher than expected, if there were weather events that were not expected, um, if the material's not behaving as it should, for example, if there's alkali silica reaction, then the FAA dictates that the pavement needs to be either maintained or rehabilitated. So uh, the question being, um, are premature failures acceptable? No, they're not. But if they occur, they're expected to be addressed. So 
as payment designers, we do our best to design payments, but if a, a pavement, especially on airfield, reaches a certain condition where it's not safe for aircraft to travel on, then that runway will be shut down with the expectation that it will be um, fixed in order to um, in order to match that performance. So I hope I, I answered that question well. And if there are, are follow-up questions, I'll please please feel free to to raise your hand and, and type the the question in the chat box. Now in in um, St. Louis here in this example, they noticed that the the PCI was going down over time, and they think that there may have been some alkali silica reaction occurring. Well, how, how did they determine this? Well, they did a couple of non-destructive tests. They used the falling weight deflectometer FWD and they used the ground penetrating radar, or GPR. And these were used to um, ensure that there was enough structural capacity for the pavement sections. And they did these tests, the FWD and the GPR, not only on kind of the central core of the pavement, which was that original pavement that had the concrete overlaid with asphalt, overlaid with concrete. They also did it on the two ends of the pavements. And they found out that according to the pavement structure they had in place, within the core of the runway, they meet or exceeded expectations for the next 20 years. So that, that passed the far field design strategy. But the east section of the runway, which is one of the runways that was extended and had a different pavement structure, only had a 7 to 12 year lifespan predicted by far field. So that's something that is would not be acceptable long term to the FAA and some sort of design strategy would have to be provided in order to fix that. Now the reason that they thought that there were uh, alkali silica reaction or ASR occurring was due to petrographic examination. So they took some cores and they ran this petrographic test and they found that they had dolomitic limestone and strained quartz or quartzite in the sand. And these all reacted together to form some ASR gel. And they found that there was damage due to this reactivity with the ASR. So this is something that they thought was a problem. So overall, when they were um, looking at the runway, they found that the original construction, which was um, the, the section of pavement that was built in the 40s and built up on, was structurally sound. But then as you got toward the edges of the pavement where they had that new pavement structure, it was uh, not adequate for the 20-year design. They found that the distresses from the ASR reaction were not expected to um, generate significant FOD or foreign object degree, debris, but they did feel it was a problem and um, the, any spalling that would occur uh, did need to be addressed. And their recommendations for this is that for those panels that did have enough ASR damage, they recommend a removal and replacement of those PCC panels. Also, any sort of um, crack rehabilitation, any sort of cracks that were forming, they suggested to rehabilitate those, and that would decrease further deterioration. They felt that they need to route and seal the cracks that were forming. And what this does is it basically acknowledges that there is a crack there, but it, it cleans the crack edges, makes everything nice and square, and then you can seal that and prevent more material from going in. And then finally, they recommended you they uh, fix any sort of spall repairing. So when those cracks hit up a joint, that often created spalling, which is the deterioration of the joint. So they recommend that they uh, replace those. And they feel that these four recommendations of the first phase, the multi-phase overall runway reconstruction, and they did a, a bit of a life cycle cost analysis here. They had three different alternatives. They had a full rehabilitation in year one. Um, they had the recommended options in year zero and then a full rehabilitation in year 10. And then uh, the third option uh, was doing the recommended in year zero, a major repair in year 10, and a full rehabilitation in year 20. And you can see how that decreases the cost of, um, of, of fixing the pavement pretty significantly. Now, 
granted, that does mean that in the future you'll have incurred costs, but through this life cycle cost analysis, those were the numbers that they came up with, and um, the cost slowly decreased, generally because the future cost of money is, is less than the, the current cost of money. So this is just one example of one airport strategy to um, um, rehabilitate their pavement. And I apologize, we're running a little short on time. I want to get through the sustainability question. So if you do have questions, I encourage you to type them into the chat box. But what I'll do is I'll finish the presentation up, and then I'll wait along. I'll wait around until um, everyone has had their questions answered. So the example for sustainability that we looked at is a life cycle cost analysis. And what they wanted to do at the Calgary International Airport is add a new parallel runway. So you can see in the picture down there at the bottom of the screen, there is a runway kind of heading up and down. And then there is a runway heading left to right, kind of toward the top of the picture. They wanted to build a new left to right air, uh, runway in the area that's circled. And this runway, which is called 17L35R, is scheduled for completion in 2014. And it will provide this new FAA Group 6 um, category. So a larger type airplane will be able to land on this runway. It will be 14,000 feet long and 200 feet wide. And this has actually been planned since the early 70s. The airport owns the land where this runway will be built. It just has not been built yet. And what they did is they um, performed a life cycle cost analysis to compare a rigid and a flexible payment design using far field. And this is from the same conference, the Airfield and Highway Pavement Conferences from 2013 in Los Angeles, put out by ASCE, and it's from NOAC, is the author. Here you can see the equivalent far field pavement structures. They put in all the inputs for the soil and the aircraft types that they expected. And they ran an analysis on a rigid pavement and a flexible pavement. And you can see that the rigid pavement has uh, about um, 43 centimeters of Portland cement concrete, 20 centimeters of cement treated base, 15 centimeters of crushed granular base, and then their sub base for a total thickness of 1.1 meters. And then for the flexible, they had 12 centimeters of hot mix. 25 centimeters of stabilized um, asphalt stabilized material, 25 centimeters of crushed base course, and then uh, 13, 135 centimeters sub base for a total thickness of almost two meters, and they were designed for 20 years. In the life cycle cost analysis, they included an initial capital cost. They used a 10-year average from the Bank of Canada for the discount rate for the present worth calculations. And the 10-year average is 2.69%. They include annual maintenance costs and any sort of intermediate rehabilitation and reconstruction. And then they assume the salvage value at the end of the LCC time frame was a percentage of the remaining life. So every certain years, they provo provided maintenance and, and rehabilitation. And you can use a percentage of the remaining life based on when the maintenance and rehabilitation was occurred. And that's what they assumed the salvage value was. And they also included what they called user costs or user negatives. For example, if you're doing any sort of construction and then the maintenance and the rehabilitation, there is a possibility for aircraft delays. And they assumed that was 30% of the cost of the rehabilitation for the flexible pavements and 10% for the rigid. So a couple assumptions here, and, and that will come through in the price, but that's one of the difficult things about doing life cycle cost analysis is that often assumptions do need to be made. So lots of numbers on this slide. This was the initial cost of flexible pavement. And you can see it goes all the way from the subgrade compaction, the granular subbase, all the way down to the actual grooving. And this was a total of $170 per square meter. And I would assume, it wasn't stated, but I would assume this is Canadian dollars. And it was done in 2009. And you can do the same thing for the rigid pavement, the subgrade compaction, the granular subbase, all the way up to the runway grooving. And it was $176 total compared to $170 for the flexible. 
So if you're just looking at the initial cost, the flexible pavement is a little cheaper, about $6 a square meter cheaper. And now, um, through the life cycle cost analysis, they have to do the maintenance and rehabilitation. So for maintenance, they assumed cracks, healing, and patching. And that was from years 1 to 14. And for the uh, rehabilitation, they assumed a mill and replace of about 2 inches. And that was at year 15 and 29. And you can see that the percentage of initial cost, that changes how much the maintenance and rehabilitation will cost. Um, but they did a really good job of lining up what they were going to do for the full 40 years. And you can see the same thing, the maintenance and rehabilitation for the uh, rigid pavement. They assumed that um, from 1 to 9, there was no maintenance or rehabilitation. Then they had cracking and sealing from year, crack sealing and patching from years 10 to 14. And then some slab repa replacement at year 15. And then they went through that same five-year cycle. So five years of crack sealing and patching, one year of slab replacement, five years of crack sealing and patching, one year of slab replacement. And you can go down here. And they also calculated this as an initial capital, a percentage of initial capital costs. So the bottom line, when you take all of this, um, the initial costs, the yearly costs, the end of life costs, the user costs, and bring that all back into a today's dollar, the flexible pavement costs $230 per square meter, and the rigid pavement costs $204 per square meter. And they did um, state that this is highly sensitive to material prices, the discount rate used, and a lot of the assumptions that were made. So they're very cognizant of all these details, but at the end of the day, when you're doing a life cycle cost analysis, you do have to make a lot of assumptions. On a little side note, I thought it was interesting that Google Maps is updated so frequently that they already have the construction of that new runway going on. So um, it's a the technology is just amazing how quickly it updates, and you can see the, the progress on that new runway up in Calgary as it's being constructed. <clears throat> so um, they stated some of their assumptions and the importance of the discount rate and the material prices. And I just wanted to show uh, a slide on the material prices, and you can see how um, pretty incredible it is how much material prices change. This is only a five-year um, five year window, and you can see the price of asphalt has gone from, I assume it's $100 per unit, and they probably have different units based on what material you're looking at. Maybe it's per ton. There's nothing on that y-axis. But it's gone from 100 all the way up to uh, 230 in 2008. Now it's down to 190. You can see steel has a similar spike. Concrete has been steadily increasing, while um, lumber is steadily decreasing. So material price is very sensitive, and it's very difficult to take these price trends and then extrapolate it into future costs for maintenance and rehabilitation. So in conclusion, for, the, um, for Calgary, the rigid pavement was the better cost alternative. They found that these surface conditions were easier to maintain with the rigid pavements. And another benefit they found, which I was pretty excited to see, is that the um, if they used the flexible pavement, they would have 74% more processed granular material using the flexible pavement versus the rigid. While that was accounted for in the cost, you can also think about the environmental effects of that, having to truck in and use that new material for the flexible pavement versus the rigid pavement. So in summary, oh, I forgot to update this slide. I apologize. The professional development hours will be emailed to you no later than Friday, December uh, 6th, this Friday. Um, if you get it by November 8th next year, uh, that'll, that'll be great too. But you can rewatch this pavinar through the website. If you have any topic suggestions, please submit them via the website. I'm always looking for new topics. And the next pavinar will be Tuesday, February 4th, so next semester. And it'll be an overview of bio binders as requested by the University of Guilian. So in this uh, webinar, we looked at some background, design, rehabilitation, and sustainability of airfield pavements. I'm uh, now willing to, it's 1 o'clock, so I understand if people have to get going. I apologize for bumping right up against that time. 
But if you have any questions, please raise your electronic hand, and I will um, wait for you to type the question in the chat box. And thank you very much for joining me today. I appreciate it. Well, there don't appear to be any questions, so thank you very much, and hope you have a great week.